Good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Hague for another year. I want to talk to you today about a subject that is a slight variation on some of our conversations around network transformation. Now, we've been talking network transformation for a number of years. And there's a lot of opportunities, there's been a lot of challenges that have been discussed and uh, solved through the industry as well as we've been presenting uh, from this stage even in many cases. But what's a really interesting twist that we're seeing is the convergence of network and cloud. It's something that started with SDN and NFV and it is continuing to progress in some very interesting and unusual ways. So first, one of the things that has been a lot of fun about Intel is that we're in so many different types of infrastructure. And within our data center group that the network team is, is reporting underneath, we're finding that there's three consistent mega trends, and it doesn't really matter what infrastructure you're talking about. And those mega trends are cloud, AI and analytics, and 5G. Now, Specifically with cloud economics, I know having worked in that industry as well as coming back into the communications environment, one of the things I found is there's a bit of a misconception that cloud economics means you're just cheap. It just means that you're selling the services for a lower margin. But there's actually a very important nuance within cloud economics. And it really comes down to being on the very front end of technology transitions. So we'll talk a little bit about a launch that we did recently in this year. Um, and what was really interesting about that launch is we had a number of these cloud service providers who had already launched their own services with that product that we were just launching at Intel. And that front end of the technology transition is so critical because it allows them to put more and more customers in the same resource, supported by the same resource. So it's not just about margins of services, it really is about density. And that density and that efficiency ties very tightly to being able to be on the front end of a technology transition. Now, AI and analytics is also a very interesting one. Um, there's a lot of use for it within our industry. I've seen it in CRM and customer monitoring and customer servicing. Now, I'm gonna give you another example though. It's, it's a little bit older uh, than the last couple of years, but I thought it was a really interesting anecdote that might inspire some new uses within our own industry. So there's a company in the United States, Progressive Insurance, and if you've been in the US recently, you would have seen their commercials. Flo is the person that's uh, doing a lot of the advertising. And they have a service that they will provide for their customers where if you are willing and confident that you are a conservative driver, they will let you put a sensor on the exhaust system of your automobile. Now, what that does is it gets you out of this actuarial table based on your age and assumed statistics for how most drivers at that age will be conservative or aggressive. And what's really fascinating is that data is collected, it is sent back to their actuaries, your insurance rates are set based on how you really drive versus how it is assumed that you drive. Now, what happens with the data after that is what's really interesting, because Progressive is using it for servicing their customer base, giving them a better, more granular service. What they can do, they can privatize that data. And that data becomes very useful for other studies, such as how many drivers are going past a specific intersection at six o'clock in the afternoon? Is it a good place to be able to put a coffee station? Or would it be better to put a dinner service there instead? And then that data goes through multiple rakes or multiple pivots, and it can be sold and sold until it is aged at the point where it's no longer useful. But the resale value on that data turns out to be very high. So it's not just useful for servicing customers, it's actually a value add for intelligence that other companies can use. Now, the fifth 5G transformation, we've talked a lot about network transformation in context of SDN and NFV. What's fascinating about 5G isn't that the industry is talking about it all the time, 
nor that it's a completely new network and smartphones will be serviced better. It's actually such a unique transformation. Many operators have told us you cannot efficiently operate that kind of network unless you have transformed the core of your own network. So SDN and NFV go from being something that was a vision, something considered important for OPEX and CAPEX, to being foundational and necessary to even operate a 5G network in an efficient manner. So we'll go into a couple of these trends a little bit more deeply. Cloud everywhere. Now, over the last nine months, both Amazon and Microsoft have talked about the future of cloud. The future of the cloud is at the edge. So you have Amazon Greengrass. You have Azure talking about how can we get further and further closer to the customers. So they're viewing the right of way. They're viewing these areas that are closer to the serviceable market as the next frontier for their cloud services. Now, in the cloud in the data center today, you have private cloud that's generally run public or private cloud, CIOs being able to move their workloads back and forth. In fact, Azure Stack is a great example of the capability that is coming out in this industry. Applications and machine learning also tend to be run in this cloud data center. Now, the core network is something that we've all been talking about many years, the evolved packet core, going from physical to a virtual environment, being able to handle things like network slices and the complexity of servicing new networks that have very, very different characteristics based on the needs of the customer. And then lastly, edge and access network. This is where you can have the cloud RAN, where you can have the multi-access edge whether it's for enterprise or whether it is for servicing things like CDN. So all of these things are cloud everywhere, distributed data, and it presents an opportunity for analytics again. If you have the capabilities in the cloud that you have out at the edge, and you can move the workloads back and forth to wherever they are necessary, then you can put analytics at every point in the network. And it is about operating the network in a more intelligent way, in a more efficient way, but it's also about being able to do those insights, not just about how the network is operating, but the example earlier, many of those drivers that have the progressive sensors, they're going to be driving past the access and the edge network, just based on the fact that we've had coverage that has increased so well over the last few years in the commuter lanes. Whether you're in the US or whether in, you're in Europe, you can be certain you're going to get a cell phone signal on the major byways to go from work to home. Now with 5G, one of the things that we continue to talk about is that it is not the network that we knew. It is not the wireless network of the past. There's three major use cases, massive machine to machine, and there's a lot of opportunities here. IoT as an industry has, has really been wrestling and grappling with the different economic needs and the different bandwidth needs of such a wide range of devices. When you are doing industrial automation, you really do need to be able to handle things that are low latency. When you're doing sensors in agriculture, however, you don't want to have a very expensive network or have to be able to have that entire network consumed to be economically viable because they only need to really collect data and report it every month or so. So that's one vector, one usage model. And then you look at enhanced mobile broadband. Now, if you've traveled to Asia, you would notice that most people consume media and video and television through their mobile devices. If you're a network operator in that region, I'm sure you're completely aware and have optimized the network for that. But it changes the way that the parameters of the network are set, and it is not the same as massive machine-to-machine -machine communications. And then lastly, you have low-latency real-time use cases. Now, Autonomous driving tends to be the showcase for this uh, because the difference between fully autonomous decision making is two milliseconds and not fully autonomous decision making in the car of 10 milliseconds. And I mentioned those numbers specifically because two milliseconds is the round trip that you can get at the edge. 10 milliseconds or more can be the round trip that you get if you don't have computing at the edge. 
So being able to handle these low latency, real-time communications is absolutely critical for some of these emerging use cases. And then if autonomous driving isn't enough, you have immersive media. So you have video and virtual reality, which are wonderful. You can experience and consume them. But to have a fully immersive experience, to be able to get into the video and interact and play a game as if you were in the middle of it, does require a lower latency. It's partly the cameras, it's partly the filming, but it is also very important to have that low latency. So these emerging use cases are so different and so divergent, the network slices that are necessary to be able to deliver them are going to be needed to be delivered real time, automatically. This is why many of the operators have said, you just can't operate this kind of network efficiently and effectively or economically if you don't have the automation that's built in in the cloud everywhere based on SDN and NFE. Now we're getting to some exciting news. Note, the Xeon Scalable Processor launch was in July. That is not the new news for today, but I do want to bring it back into the forefront because a lot of the discussion that we had in July didn't necessarily talk about the relationship with networking. We have our Xeon processors that we've been bringing into the market for many years with innovation like DBDK. In addition to that, the platform is able to take advantage of the Altera FPGAs for accelerated workloads. We have new Intel SSDs based on non-volatile memory called 3D NAND or 3D Crosspoint. And then the Intel Quick Assist is another innovation that came out that has been upgraded in this platform refresh. And what's really interesting in this is the infrastructure management technologies at the very far right. I described the way that these have been used in cloud to somebody at dinner last night, and I thought it would be helpful to repeat the way that this uh, is leveraged. Um, I used to do all of the technology marketing and enabling for cloud and enterprise for Intel. And what I would find the infrastructure managers doing is reading the real-time telemetry down at the platform through these infrastructure management technologies. And the counters would tell you information like memory error rates. Now, memory error rates, for any of you who are more of a system person, you know that that can be an indicator that that platform may fail, or it may go down, or the operating system may have an issue. All of those things for a services operator is a bad thing. So many of the infrastructure managers in the cloud and the enterprise will use these technologies to understand in advance of a possible failure, this platform may need to be rebooted. We may need a firmware upgrade. And then through use of virtualization, they will do what's called a live migration. What that means is the workload moves to another hardware resource and no one is the wiser except for the infrastructure manager. So it's running while it moves. And the near zero latency of the Intel virtualization technologies is what makes that possible. We have a, a number of hardware hooks to make it so that the user does not see any, any change in performance or in the service they're receiving. And then the hardware resource that is having those errors and that reporting can be upgraded with firmware, it can be rebooted, it can be restarted, all while the workload is still running. Once it's back online, you move the workload back. This is a very standard use case for much of private cloud, and you'll also see that a lot in the cloud infrastructure. So being able to take advantage of this new dynamic environment and all of these features together is why we were so excited about the Xeon Scalable Processors for Network Transformation. Now, we all love benchmarks because we're all in the technology industry, but I think real workloads are really much more of an impactful statement. So I picked out two different work streams, network and analytics. You can see the results. eBrisk has 1.9x the HEVC video transcode encode performance. You have Ericsson with Media First, 1.5x the video transcode performance of the prior generation. Telefonica, they uh, also saw a huge increase in the routing performance, in virtual routing, with the virtual BNG. And we had John Donovan from AT&T on stage. What was making this particular launch so unique is that AT&T had live services running in production at the time we were launching the platform for the first time. That had never been done in the communications industry in the past. What's very normal in cloud, this was a first. 
And what AT&T saw in terms of the results from this platform, 30% better performance on many of their workloads. And this is a very diverse set of workloads. It was four workloads, not just one use case. And then they saw 25% fewer servers needed in the same cluster. I had a reporter ask me when I was doing some of the press, isn't that a bad thing for Intel that I don't need 25% you know, as many servers? Now, my answer was, I've never met an infrastructure manager that gave CapEx back when they were not forced to. And so that 25% buys the infrastructure manager a new service opportunity. So you have the ability to leverage and take advantage of deploying new hardware for the same amount of money. Now, Intel has been working closely with the ecosystem for many, many years. And this transformation, it is not for just one company, it's for all of us working together. And so in open source and standards, there's another couple of announcements that will be coming. OPNFV Euphrates is going to be announced in the next couple of weeks, and there's a couple contributions that are really important in there. As we started doing our testing and collaboration through network builders on characterizing these workloads in a virtual environment relative to physical, we ran into a, a bit of a sticky issue, and that is that there's no standard benchmarking. Very difficult to do TCO modeling when the measurements are all different and the standards for measurements are all different. So through a, lover, a number of collaborations, we have been working with the industry to create these reference VNFs as well as what we call network standard benchmarks, contributing it into Yardstick so that the test and measurement group in the release for Euphrates will start to have the standard unit of measure that we are contributing back to the industry just to make it so much easier to be able to compare apples and apples. Now, Network Builders continues to grow. We have over 267 members, lots of solution briefs and white papers. If you've not been online, there's new content coming all the time. So 61 training courses, and in the last six months, we've managed to add three languages. So we have Chinese, Portuguese, and Spanish in addition to English. So all of this is a free reference point that Intel is providing to the industry with our partners to be able to take advantage of this transformation and know how do I navigate, and it's at all levels of the stack. Now, I mentioned that there was no standard unit of benchmarking, and that made it difficult, and frankly, I, it could have slowed the industry down in terms of accelerating the network, transform network transformation. The challenges that we saw is there's a lot of costly evaluations, but the performance tuning challenges were definitely something that was very sticky. We worked with countless partners really understanding what the performance expected versus the actual performance was. We realized that there was an opportunity for low-level optimized configurations so that you could verify the performance delivery and speed your development. And one of the capabilities from Intel that we brought out in July that is available this quarter, starting in October, is called the Intel Select Fast Track Kit for NFVI. Now what's important about this is it's for largely Network Builders members who are trying to develop capabilities and they need a stable base that has predictable performance that they can innovate on top of. So these are all really good things, but today we're very excited to announce that we do have a new select solution for NFVI that takes all of these learnings, puts them together, and with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and you can see here that HPE is announcing their support for this. So we have a common shared goal with HPE and companies like them where the communication industry really should be able to take advantage of the software-defined infrastructure, be able to have that same pace of innovation. And so the pre-integrated hardware and software provided in this capability is so important to be able to take advantage of a stable base and then get that flexibility and solutions on top of that that they don't have to worry about NFVI, do I have the right version of libraries, do I have the right version of OS. They know that they can build and have consistent performance on top. What's also exciting about it is it is a growing ecosystem. We have Ubuntu as well as Red Hat now with the Intel Select Fast Track Kit. This allows you to just do development, but the products, the things that are going to really deliver the deployment will be from Hewlett Packard, Huawei, Lenovo, and Quanta. So these are all examples of solutions that by your suppliers working together, 
and with Intel gives you the ability to scale and speed your deployment even faster. So with that, I would like to invite you to experience the Intel booth. We have a lot of great demos that are firsts for us, things like the multi-vendor intelligent edge demo. We do have a terabit per second NFVI running, as well as network slicing, some 5G ready video demos, and you can see the network standard benchmarking that I referred to as well. So thank you for your time and your attention, and have a wonderful World Congress.